Hi, it's Jan Beta, and here's the second and final episode of my Amiga 500 resurrection. This Amiga 500 was stored in a basement that got flooded, unfortunately, and I'm about halfway through the restoration process. I cleaned all the parts inside and out, and in this episode we are going to finish this restoration and do some retrobriting. We are going to repair some parts of the case. We are also going to take a look at the floppy disk drive, do a full recapping of the mainboard and some other bits and pieces, and of course some testing of the finished device. Yeah, without further ado, here we go. We left off after cleaning the case parts and now they are fully dry. So the case parts are fully dried now. I am going to glue the pieces that broke off back in. One of these pieces, the bigger one, goes here. And the other one is actually from our trapdoor flap that goes here. So I'm going to use some plastic glue, which is a plastic weld glue. Uh, I'm going to link that in the video description. The one that I used, but you can probably use other glues as well. This basically welds the plastic together by dissolving the plastic and then it uh, melts into each other, ideally. And yeah, I'm explicitly doing this before retrobriting because I think this might be a good idea. Yep, like this. So, little dabs of glue. I'm using a Q-tip to apply the glue. And this should hopefully give this some kind of strength. Yeah, but that doesn't look too bad actually. Does look quite good. This should go on here. little something like this. Okay, and that should be that, I guess. There's one crack here and one crack over here by the LED that I'm also going to fill with some glue. So I'm letting some flow in there. Yeah, that works rather well. And the same on this side here. That should be all the cracks we have. And now it's just going to be a matter of letting this sit for a while and wait. We're, we're going to see how this turns out. Okay, I fixed the cracks in the case and on the trapdoor cover. And I think it's time to slightly retrobrite this now. I am only going to do the top half of the case because that is more yellowed. Uh, the inside is more or less the original color this should be in. And as you can see, the top half is a bit yellower than that. The bottom half though, is pretty much the original color also around the parameter. So I'm not going to retrobrite that. I'm only going to do the top part. For the case part, because it's so large and I don't have a container to completely submerge this in, I'm going to use peroxide cream that I'm going to apply with the brush and then wrap it in cling wrap, clear cling wrap that you would use in your kitchen. I actually got uh, some from my kitchen. And for the keys, I'm going to put them in a translucent container and use this liquid peroxide. And then I'm going to put a grow light on top, which is kind of a full spectrum light or 
it claims to be a full spectrum light meant to be used for uh, plant growth, obviously. The purpose of that is to speed up the chemical reaction that is a bleaching reaction. There's a very good video that Jeff Bird made a while back. I'm going to link that in the video description and in the info box uh, if you want to check that out about how retrobriting actually works. Retrobriting is a bleaching process, so you can actually uh, get discoloration if you're not careful. Uh, usually with my method it's pretty slow, it takes a couple of hours, but usually I get pretty nice results with it. Let's see if it works on this one. So I'm going to apply a thin layer of hydrogen peroxide. This is 12%, uh, that's the highest percentage I can get here in Germany. Yeah, then wrap it in cling wrap and put it in my retrobriting box, as you're going to see, which is just a cardboard box covered in aluminum foil from the inside to reflect the grow light light. <laughs> that's the plan. Let's do that. I'm also going to put these smaller parts in there. And as I said, the keys are going to go into some liquid peroxide, which is also 12%. I'm going to wear gloves for this operation and I'm going to go in every half hour and massage the cream on this part of the case around a bit so I don't get discoloration like marbling effects or uh, streaking or something like that. I'm going to be super careful with this because it is brittle plastic. Usually retrobriting doesn't make it any more brittle in my experience because it's just uh, affecting the surface. Your mileage may vary. So yeah, let's do it. I'm putting some cling wrap on the surface here. The cling wrap is only so that the cream doesn't evaporate, which would lead to discolorations. Trying to spread this out as evenly as I can, and I'm going to apply a layer of hydrogen peroxide to the foil, actually. Which, in my experience, helps. I'm also going to apply some to the actual case. And as I said, you only need a thin layer of this stuff, usually. The more even you manage to spread it, the more even your results are going to look like. But you don't have to be super careful about this. Okay, getting this on here. And you want to make sure this is as clean as you can possibly get it. I'm just applying this like a layer of paint, basically. I'm not going to put anything on the insides, just on the parameter here. Because the insides are not going to be visible. And they are pretty much the uh, color that they should be already, so not too worried about that. I'm going to wrap some additional cling wrap around the back side in a second here, so that this stuff doesn't have any chance to escape. And there we go. And that's our top half of the case. That's going to go into my retro writing box like this. For these smaller parts, obviously we need cling wrap as well. And I'm going to do the same process basically. Smaller parts obviously are a bit easier to handle than the huge Amiga 500 case. <laughs> That's that one wrapped. Just in case you were wondering, uh, you could do this in sunlight, but today it's pretty cloudy again. There aren't many opportunities to do this in the northern part of Germany where I am located, even if it's summer or it's supposed to be summer. So, all wrapped. I'm going to put this stuff into my retro writing box. So I got my case parts in my retro writing box that can use a makeover and I'm going to use this container to put the keys inside. 
I am going to remove the sticker on the spacebar though. <laughs> and the keys are all in. I'm going to put some liquid peroxide on there. The li liquid stuff can actually be reused, so that's pretty nice. I'm closing the lid on the box. Ready for the first round of Retrobrite. <laughs> I'm putting my grow light on top here and I'm going to let it sit for half an hour. And I'm slightly handling this and massaging the cream to other bits. And I'm going to repeat this as long as necessary. I'm also slightly putting these into different positions. The keys I shook and stirred kind of another round. This might take several hours. Yeah, I'm repeating this until the parts are no longer yellowed. And while the chemicals are doing their magic, let's take a look at this disk drive and see if I can save that. So this definitely needs a thorough cleaning from the outside at first. I suspect there's quite some dirt in there as well. Doesn't look that bad from the bottom side, so... That's good. Cleaned up rather nicely already. But we're going to see what it looks like inside. Okay, there's a lot of dust in there, but we can remove that. I'm going to use uh, a lot of Q-tips and some isopropanol and clean this. Some rust spots there that we can remove probably, hopefully. But it does look in better condition than I thought. So let's clean this up. So I'm just cleaning the dirtiest parts first. But most of it is dust, actually. That's good. Eh, it's not good that there's dust in there, but it's good that there's nothing else in there. No mud. Yeah, a little mud. Maybe. Yeah, this uh, might take a while. Okay, Houston, we have a problem. Uh, this here in my hand is one of the Reed Ride hats. There's two of them on this holder here. One on top and one on the bottom. And one of them, uh, or at least this is the cover for them. There's actually spools in there. You can maybe see them in there. Uh, one of them just came off and I think, if I see it correctly, the spools also got dislocated. So, um, might be time to give up on this one. This is normally, of course, this is glued in, so, yeah. This is completely damaged, the, the coil. Yeah, that came off. I'm not sure what happened to this. Maybe it was broken before. These are the read right heads. And this drive is now officially dead. So there's no way to fix that unless you have a replacement head and some very good patience to realign that. Bummer! So there goes our disk drive. It looked pretty good and I don't think I ripped the head off with my cleaning because I was aware that there are heads underneath there. So yeah, I don't know what happened. So this is missing a head. <laughs> I'm sorry little drive. There's no point in cleaning you any further. Maybe I can use this for spares at some point. There's my sad little note. <laughs> Sorry little drive. The disk drive cables cleaned up pretty nicely though. There's a slight hint of dust still on there, but other than that, these look as good as new, so I'm definitely going to reuse these. Time to do some work on these keyboard parts. I think I want to kind of soak these springs in alcohol at first and then slightly scrub them. And then I'm probably going to give them some WD-40 after that. 
Some of them there's a bit of rust and dirt, but uh, most of these look pretty pristine. So I'm just going to give these a little spray down with WD-40. And then after that, these are going to be polished slightly. I want to give them a bit of a soak in that stuff so they don't corrode any further. I guess we can put the rest of the keyboard back together at this point. So the plastic part from the keyboard that was rather filthy turned out pretty nicely after some work uh, submerging this in soapy water and then working on it for a bit more with the toothbrush and uh, some q-tips this looks rather nice now again i think i want to give these plungers a little wipe with alcohol and then put them back in here Okay, time to put each and every one of these plungers back into its place. And thankfully, these keyboards actually allow you to do that while they are lying flat on the table. And some others, you have to prop them up to insert these correctly. But these just slide into position in this position. <laughs> And I'm going to give these uh, contacts a bit of a wipe with the Q-tip soaked in contact cleaner. Usually that works really well. And these are all the same except for the one that goes into the position where the caps lock key is, which in this case is blue. It has a different footprint you're going to. You're not going to be able to put another plunger in there. And the LED also goes in that position. So here's where the LED with the contacts, it actually has carbon contacts as well, as I mentioned, that goes there. And this is our one different plunger. Hooray! Now I'm going to soak a Q-tip in some contact cleaner and just give each of these contacts a tiny little wipe down. That's going to take a while. So at this stage, I think we can put this back together, at least this part. The keycaps are still retro brighting. But we should be able to place our membrane on here and our metal part. And then get some screws back in there. <laughs> This should now be safe to turn around <laughs> and insert our circuit board. Or rather, insert the membrane back into our circuit board here. and lock it in place. And there's one screw on the circuit board that has some grounding pads on it. And that's a larger screw with a kind of a washer built in. So that should be that one. And this should go on here like so. So let's put all the screws back in. I am also going to add a new cable tie. And that's our whole keyboard assembly back together, minus the keycaps and the springs, obviously, and the little clips. The springs and the clips are going to be cleaned don't want that much 
WD-40 on there. Just a little. <laughs> also, WD-40 smells good. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be fun taking these apart. So the case is pretty much finished retro brighting. And I gave the key caps a couple more rounds. And I think they need one more even in this container, which is this is bubble wrap that has a layer of aluminum on it. So yeah, I'm just stirring this every half hour. And there's some keys that still have some yellow on them. Not sure if I can bring these back to the original color completely, but this is the way I do it. The case parts only took like four hours in the retro writing box, but the keycaps are severely more yellowed, so they take a bit more time. Just for the sake of this being a full restoration, I decided to recap this board. That means I'm going to replace all the electrolytic capacitors on here with new good brand ones. That is something that is not strictly necessary on these Amigas. Usually, usually the capacitors are good on these boards, but it doesn't hurt to replace like 35 plus years old capacitors. So I'm going to do it just to make this a full restoration. I'm going to go one by one to not mix up the polarities or the values that these have. I'm using the same capacitance to replace the original ones. I'm using the same voltage ratings and maybe some higher voltage ratings, but only ever so slightly, because otherwise, if you go too high voltage, the capacitor behavior is going to change a bit. So I'm not going to do that. Basically, I'm replacing same with the same just with good brand 105 degrees Celsius rated capacitors that should provide some longer life to this board, hopefully. Everything's recapped. I mostly used Panasonic FC series capacitors. Usually they work really well for vintage computers. And uh, these are Nichicon. So all good brand capacitors. I hope this still works. We're going to give this a quick check and see if it still powers on. Okay, crossing my fingers. Let's see if this still powers up correctly. It should. Yep. And as far as my keycaps are concerned, these also seem to be finished. There's some very slight yellowing still. But it's not very obvious. And I don't think these are getting any better. I've had this in here for a couple of hours more now. So we are going to reuse our peroxide, as I said. So I'm going to try to get it back in its bottle. <laughs> and these keycaps are going to get a good wash. Water is completely sufficient for that. Yeah, and I'm going to let these thoroughly dry. The keys turned out pretty nicely. There are some minor discolorations still, like on the uh, enter key here. You can see this line here probably. Uh, that's because the yellowing was so severe that the plastic is kind of decomposed. So some of the gray keys have some uh, brighter spots, unfortunately, but most of the brighter keys, which are kind of an off-white beige color originally, 
they do look kind of original again. So I'm going to put these on the keyboard and see how it looks when it's back together. This is going to take a while <clears throat> and I'm going to try to get every key in the correct position and for that purpose I have my spares keyboard here which is super dirty and super yellow uh, to, just to see where the keys go. And we're going to put a spring on here and we're going to put the retaining clips back in of course and we should have a keyboard after that, hopefully. And hopefully it still works, I don't know yet. Now for the spacebar, there's actually two different sized screws. These are slightly smaller than the other ones, smaller diameter. And the spacebar has obviously this long clip here that can be a bit fiddly. There we go. And all the other springs are the exact same size, so that shouldn't be an issue. And I have to say, retro writing feels kind of magic. Sometimes. This looks nearly as good as new. For my next trick, I'm going to put the circuit board back into this RF shield, which I tried to remove more of the rust on with some vinegar and some aluminum foil, which usually works pretty well. It's not perfect. I guess it's better than before. Remember to put this sheet back in here to insulate the circuit board from the metal. And then the circuit board goes on top. And obviously we have to screw this in again. Also slightly overlaps down here, so it's not quite clipped in, but it overlaps. So I'm going to put all these screws back in. I'm not going to bore you with that, I guess. <laughs> and then I'm going to put this into the case. So all the screws on the back side are back in. I'm going to put it in the bottom case, which we didn't do any retro writing on, but it looked kind of its original color, so. Not too worried about that. This clips in this spot here, which usually is broken off. I wonder why this is intact on this case. Maybe the circuit board never left the case before. So, and I actually found a disk drive that doesn't have broken written on it, which is the exact same model as this one. So I hope it works. Not quite sure where this came from, but uh, it was in my parts bin. So I'm going to put it in here and uh, screw it in. But I'm not fitting the screws from the bottom yet. I want to test this before I do any further assembly. So, okay, this should be in place. I want to put the keyboard in to be able to properly test this. It does look pretty nice. I mean, there, is, there are some rust stains and things like that, but all in all, it does look rather nice. We have to bend these tabs. I'm not sure if I want to put the top part of the RF shield back in. It's not really necessary for operation. At first, let me test this in this state. So let's try to turn this on. And it has a red power LED. We didn't see that yet. That's a nice one. And that was really quick. And the drive is ticking. So maybe we have a working Amiga. I'm going to try the Amiga test kit. That is a very good tool for testing Amigas, as the name suggests. Let's see if that starts up. It does! Yay! Yeah, so this basically allows me to check all the functions of the Amiga. Let's start with the memory test. I don't have the memory expansion in here yet. We are going to test the memory that's on board. That's looking good. I think the memory is good in this one. That's a good start. Uh, the keyboard. So far, it did work. I'm going to try to press each of the keys. 
seems it's working and it looks pretty nice as well. Okay, keyboard is all right. Let's test the audio. Yup. That is all working. Sound is working perfectly fine. Video is working fine, probably. Yep. CIAs are always a thing that fails. Let's see. All tests passed. Okay. So, yeah, this basic Amiga seems to be perfectly working. That's great. Yeah, this seems to work fine. So, uh, I guess let's try the memory expansion in there. I'm going to put the remaining screws uh, for the disk drive in at this point, because that seems to work fine. I'm also going to close the side expansion slot, which turned out the same color as the rest, which is nice. After retro writing, that is. I think I don't want to put the top RF shield in here because usually without the RF shield, cooling is a bit better, obviously, because there's more airflow. So I'm just going to screw this back in place, I guess. Oh, there's this little bezel that goes on top of the expansion port here. That obviously has to go back on. So that's our circuit board in place. So uh, I'm not going to put this memory expansion switch back in here because there's just so few games or software titles that don't work with a 512k memory expansion. Instead, this should be permanently activated by just putting a little jumper on this J2 position here. I think it's activated in this position. We're going, if, if it's not activated, we're going to remove that, obviously. I'm going to put that in now. So this should be relatively easy with the case opened. Usually you have to put these in from the bottom. I have to do the same because this just fits on these plastic rails that are on here. And then it should plug into this connector, which it does. But it doesn't go all the way in because this connector is the wrong size. Ah, cheap memory expansion, I guess. But in theory, if the memory expansion works, this should now be a one megabyte RAM Amiga 500. It still starts up, which is a good sign. Maybe the memory expansion works as well. One megabyte total memory detected. Seems to be good. I'm going to keep this running for a while to see if it really is good. I'm going to take a short break and I'll come back with the results. Yeah, and as you can see, this seems to be fully working. I think we can close the case now, literally. So here it goes. I actually strengthened some of those cracked parts with some epoxy. Hope this is going to hold together, but it looks, as you can see, it looks uh, pretty much as good as new. And also the glued parts, this is a bit visible here, got a bit scratched, but it's basically in very good condition again. So pretty happy how this turned out. Okay, let's put those screws back in. Not going to tighten these too much because uh, I know for a fact that this case is super brittle. And it is done! Okay, let's have some fun. Well, that restoration took the better of three days and it's about 
half past 10 in the evening at this point. I think I owe myself one of these. Skull. This is an alcohol-free beer, in case you were wondering. Thank you so much for sitting through this whole process with me. I hope it was entertaining and maybe a tiny bit educational. Maybe you learned some new tricks. Special thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon and on the channel memberships page or on Ko-fi and PayPal. The links are in the video description. Nudge, nudge. And also thanks for your subscriptions and your comments and your thumbs up or down, whatever you like. I'm Jan Beta. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.